Hi, everybody. So in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the last two things, interventions that might result in inefficiency and dead weight loss. And that would be price ceilings and subsidies. And I'm going to warn you that subsidies have a really freaky looking graph, but you're going to be just fine. You're going to be just fine. Uh, price ceilings, as we already studied, they're a legal maximum on prices. Um, they decrease the price paid by certain buyers and therefore benefit them. Obviously, those people benefit, but at the same time, other buyers are unable to obtain the product because now there's a shortage and, and all of the sellers are hurt, right? The ones who are able to sell at the lower price are hurt, and then there's some sellers who are left out in the cold. So um, that's our original picture of consumer and producer surplus, but we'll take a look at how it transforms with the price ceiling. Now, both of these, price ceilings and subsidies, are designed to help consumers typically um, as a result of, of these policies. So we're gonna see, we'll just use the same numbers here. Um, we've got five and 12. We're gonna see that it ends up changing some of the surpluses in interesting ways. The price ceiling is down here. Now, I know some students are like, well, that's confusing. Why do they put the ceiling down here and the floor up there? Um, what sometimes I find it helpful to do is to actually say, well, you know, you've got this point and this point, and what did we say? We said this was 10 here. Um, and we don't have a number here, but I'm just going to draw that one and say it's 14 because we know that this amount where quantity demanded is bigger than quantity supplied is a shortage. But what some students have pointed out to me is that that's kind of like a ceiling in a house, right? So if that helps you, there you go. Um, now, for us, what we're going to notice is that with the price ceiling, this is the price that the, the buyers, buyers pay and that the sellers earn. So again, it, it's not driving a wedge between the two. It's just saying this is the maximum. And we said that that's four. And so this amount down here is now the producer surplus. It's very small because remember the price is now lower and it goes to the supply curve. The quantity that's being bought and sold is now 10. And so we'd say all of that is consumer surplus. And you can see that you know some amount, this amount in here, in this area was used to be part of producer surplus and got transformed into consumer surplus. Now this area, just like we've seen in the others, is the dead weight loss. It's the value of the transactions that should have happened but didn't. We went from 12 to 10. Uh, now we obviously are concerned about the 14 people who are now, or the, the four people who, who don't get the product, um, but we aren't as really worried about the, the two people who decided, oh, now that the price is so low, I'm going to stand in line. Well, they, these people, they weren't going to get it before anyway, so they don't count as part of the deadweight loss. But the 10 to the 12, they do count as the deadweight loss because those people used to be getting it before the price ceiling. Okay, now we're going to do subsidies. Now, subsidies we haven't really talked about very much, but they are basically the opposite of a tax. A per unit subsidy would be a payment from the government to the seller um, for producing a good or a service. And we see them in things like vaccines. Um, we see them in college tuition where the government subsidizes the thing because they want to increase the quantity of the transactions. So they just reduce the cost and, and it moves that supply curve to the right or down um, is the other way to think about it because it's cutting the cost of producing. So let's go ahead and draw a big old supply and demand graph. Okay. And again, I'm going to say this to you. It's useful to draw nice and big, right? Draw nice and big because that way you can see what's going on in your pictures. Now that's five and that's 12. Now here's where it's gonna get scary, right? Don't look at that, don't look at that, it's really scary. We're gonna shift this supply curve down and we're gonna say that this is S subsidy because what it's doing is reducing the input costs of producing. So it increases supply, it's, right? it's a rightward shift is the other way to think about it. But the vertical amount that it's shifted down by is the per unit amount of the subsidy. So it's $2 cutting the cost every single time. Now the new quantity is going to be where S subsidy and demand intercept. And so we'll say that that's over here at 14. Now that's going to be at a price lower than five. And we'll just, for the sake of keeping it simple, we'll say that that's at four. Now this is the price that the buyers pay. Because this shifted the supply curve down, right? This is the price that the buyers, buyers paid four. But remember that the government provided two additional dollars on top of what the buyers paid. So the buyers paid four, the government adds in two. And so how much do the sellers get to keep? Well, on the original supply curve is how much they get to keep. Remember this vertical distance is two. So two plus four must be 
six. So the sellers earned, or the sellers get to keep six. And that vertical distance is the per unit subsidy. And in this case, it's $2. Now, there's a few things that are going on here. It's a little hard to see. And in this graph below, I've tried to illustrate it with that weird kind of light orange color. The area from where the sellers earned, right, from that point, that line, we should say, the sellers got to keep six down to the supply curve. All of that is the producer surplus. I know that it seems weird, but think about it. It's producer surplus is what's the amount that you earned down to the supply curve. So that's the producer surplus. Now the, the consumer surplus is from the price they paid up to the demand curve. So the price they paid was four up to the demand curve, right, is like that. Now there's an overlapping shape in the middle. So we know that's consumer surplus, that's producer surplus. This is also, right, producer surplus. Um, this is also consumer surplus. And this stuff is both producer surplus and consumer surplus. It's overlapping. And that's, again, it's because of the subsidy. So it's a little weird, um, but, but it basically means that both of them are happy because it's a subsidy. It's like government money. Now, the subsidy cost of the government, I'm not going to necessarily draw this one on here. But if you know that there's 14 of them, 14 of them being bought, like the quantity under the subsidy times the $2, then the area of that box, and again, if you can imagine that box, right, imagine that box a little bit, that's the area of the cost to government of the subsidy. Because again, a tax revenue box would be the, the amount that's bought and sold under the tax times the actual amount of the tax. So if you bought and sold 10 and the tax was $2, the tax revenue box would be 20. In this case, we're figuring out how much does, the, how much does this thing cost the government? Well, you're gonna have 14 times the two, so it's $28. Now, here's the interesting thing, right? You've got this triangle here, if you look on my graph, that isn't part of producer and consumer surplus, but was, was a cost to the government. If you look down here, you can even see it on this graph. And that actually is the loss as a result of this surplus. It's the deadweight loss. And I know that that might seem a little strange. The other way to think about deadweight loss is it's the measure of the inefficiency. Now, anything that we think about in this context might be helpful to just think inefficiency is the value of the transactions that should not have happened or that you know, that should not have happened that did, or that did not happen that should have. And so I know that that sounds like a bunch of, of word salad, but it's the idea of like the value of the transactions that, that weren't supposed to be there. And in this case, we had two more transactions occur than what we did previously. And so these also, this money did not get transformed into surplus. It's the other reason why it's deadweight loss. It's just like gone, disappeared into the world. Um, it's tax revenue money that we spent, right, on something that didn't get transformed into surplus. So that's why we call it deadweight loss. All right, so hopefully this helps you. I'll see you next time.